Welcome to the Champions of Active Women podcast. In each episode, we share stories and experiences of active female role models and individuals who support the active pursuits of girls and women. Our goal is to encourage and inspire girls and women to be active for a lifetime, to reach their goals, and to break new barriers in sport and life. This podcast is brought to you by the Active Women's Health Initiative in the Sports Medicine Research Institute at the University of Kentucky. The mission of the Active Women's Health Initiative is to optimize health and promote physical activity and wellness for girls and women across the lifespan. If you enjoy this podcast, you can make a donation to the Active Women's Health Initiative at uky.networkforgood.com. Your contribution helps us empower all girls and women to find their inner athlete and become athletes for life. Dr. Katherine Thompson is an Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Dr. Bing Zhang Department of Statistics at the University of Kentucky. She earned undergraduate degrees in mathematics and biology from the University of Kentucky, and then a master's and PhD in statistics from The Ohio State University. Her research centers on developing statistical methods to address biologically relevant topics in the biomedical sciences and focuses on predictive modeling and identification of risk factors for outcomes of interest. Dr. Thompson stays active by playing soccer, running, and walking. She loves running with John Striders, a local running group, and has run four half marathons to date and participated in the 200-mile Bourbon Chase Team Relay in 2017. In March of 2020, Dr. Thompson had a major unexpected open heart surgery and is currently working on building up walking and jogging stamina. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be here. So I, I want to start our conversation today by learning about your, your love of activity and, and where that started for you. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I was thinking about this and it really goes back to growing up. And so I grew up in um, Oldham County outside of Louisville. I have two brothers. One is two years older than me, Christopher, and one's two years younger than me, Benjamin. And the three of us just always ran together. And so we were, yeah, I feel like we were always playing something outside, whether it be soccer, football, basketball, you name it. Um, So it started really there and then started um, playing soccer when I was really young, like three or four years old. Um, So just always sort of been there, always sort of been a part of my life. Yeah, I've heard that from so many people that siblings or cousins or just this general sense of I just love to play and and that that really is what has fueled a life lifetime of activity, which I think is so cool. (laughs) So you had your brothers there. Were there other important people in your life who were supporting your activity? Yeah, absolutely. I would say the the next two that come to mind are definitely mom and dad. So as soon as I got into recreational soccer at age three or four, they were driving us up to the fields all of the time. And so they were always encouraging us to play outside and play and be a part of teams and that sort of thing. So as that sort of morphed, we, you know, I moved into playing select soccer when I was probably in middle school and continued that throughout high school. Um, so always just kind of teammates, coaches, parents, family being there and, and just it being a constant thing for us is really important. So were mom or dad athletes or just supportive of, of you and your pursuits? Um, both really supportive. Um, I know my dad actually was my first soccer coach. And so he was a baseball kid growing up, but moved over to soccer when we started playing, which was super fun. And I remember him playing indoor soccer when I was little and going to the indoor soccer fields to watch him. Um, and then I remember mom being active as well. She, she used to go on walks during the summer and that sort of thing. So always just very encouraging. So, um, you know, you've mentioned soccer a couple of times and it seems to be the sport that, that kind of caught you from a young age. What was it about soccer that you loved? Oh, I don't know. I just loved it. I loved, there's just something about the sport that I just love. Um, I, I think there's a big difference for me when I'm playing soccer versus growing up, like 
running was always just sort of running, but in soccer, you don't really realize how much you're running or how much you're working. Um, so that was always a big part of it for me. Um, I was also terrible at anything that required hand-eye coordination <laughs> and sports never really came easy to me, not even soccer. Um, but there was something about being able to kick the ball that I just loved. And I was certainly better at kicking the ball than throwing the ball. So we, so going that route was really good. And then it was just, yeah, part of a part of what I did for a long time. Yeah. And did you ever have any periods, you know, I, it sounds like you did mostly soccer Were the other sports involved there or just mostly soccer, mostly soccer. My brothers played, um, T-ball and I think my little brother played basketball at one point and then both ended up kicking football for a while as well. Um, so I was sort of around other sports, but soccer was always my sport for yeah. sure. Um, when I went to college, I did pick up ultimate frisbee, which was interesting. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a twist. And, and that was sort of, you know, my friends were playing it and I discovered pretty quickly that it was the same runs as soccer, but with a frisbee. And so, um, but up until that point, it was really all soccer all the time. <laughs> yeah. We, um, it's interesting you say that because I, I, so I've got a son who's nine and he's really into soccer and we're trying to find other things for him to do to just keep him diversified. And one of the things we found this summer was an ultimate Frisbee league and he's been having a lot of fun doing that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Also didn't require me to throw it as long as I was in the right spot and my teammates came close to me. So that was helpful to just run and catch mostly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, how did that transition, you had this love of soccer and just moving and being active in your youth. How did that transition into your adulthood physical activity? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say the first, there were a couple of transition points as I, as I moved mostly cities and schools. So when I went to undergrad, um, I went to UK and picked up ultimate Frisbee, which was really nice because there was always pickup groups going on. I knew I wouldn't play soccer competitively in college. I did play some intramural pickup here or there whenever there was a choice, but, but Frisbee was pretty much going on all the time. So I love that, played that a ton. Um, and then when I went to grad school, I ended up getting connected with the soccer league recreationally up there pretty quickly. Um, but also started to run along the way. And it came originally started because of an injury that I had from soccer. I wasn't allowed to play for a while, but I could run. And it was the first time that I had jogged without jogging being in order to condition me to play soccer better. And so mm -hmm. um, it was just a totally different perspective on running. And from there, I ended up picking up running and carrying that out throughout adulthood. So did you like that immediately or was it odd to be doing something that wasn't involving kind of a sport and, and competition with others? Soccer is very much a team sport. Running is very much not. So <laughs> I imagine there were some real differences there for you. Yes, absolutely. And so the injury I had, I had actually torn a hamstring. And so I had like four or five months of no soccer, no jogging, nothing. And so I think that break really made anything I could do where I was moving faster than a walk, super, super exciting. And so when I started, I, I loved that I could do something, even if that something was jogging. And it was also in really small increments. And so all the running I had done before was starting you know, somewhere in the two to three mile range. And this was starting with a quarter mile. And so it's just a lot different of a perspective to be like, well, here's something I can do. I'm really excited about it. And knowing you can go further than what you're doing. It was just a totally different way to start that process and definitely made me fall in love with running as well. Yeah. So you fell in love with running. Um, what motivates you to be active, whether that's running or other things? Ooh, that's a good question. I think, um, seeing the people around me be active and also like knowing how much better I do in other areas of life when I am active. Like it's just, everything goes better. I have a lot of friends now who run, we play soccer, we, you know, so it's sort of become this, like this way to develop and maintain friendships as well as ways to, to stay active. And then knowing that I get all of that back, um, when I do better and at other times as well. So tell me what doing better in other areas of your life looks like. How are other areas of your life better because of physical activity? So I think physical activity just kind of clears my mind and it keeps me calmer. So it's definitely my stress reliever. I'll say like, if I have a rough day at work, I say, oh, I have to go on a run. Like that's yeah. my immediate response. Um, and so um, even my boyfriend knows he's like, okay, that's fine. I'll see you. <laughs> see you later. Um, so 
So I think it's definitely a stress reliever and there's something about it that just helps clear my head. I mean, it's, it's almost like I can get separated enough from whatever is tough and whatever is hard that a solution or a process toward a solution can kind of start to like work itself out. So, um, I always joke with my students that the number of homework problems I solved on runs in grad school is more than you would expect. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we've talked so far about your activity and um, I know that in, um, I guess about a year ago, a little over a year ago, you had a an unexpected health challenge that really um, derailed a lot of that activity. So I, could you share a little bit about that experience with us? Sure, sure. So. Um, in March of 2020, I thought I had a virus and I started spiking fevers and the fever started getting higher and higher. And so um, I ended up spiking a fever that was like up to 105.1 degrees, which is very high, even according to Google, um, <laughs> for an adult especially. So so went to the emergency room and through a series of scans and tests, we figured out that I had an infection that had gotten into my bloodstream. And so we had to figure out where that bacterial infection was coming from, turned out that it was in my heart. And so in hindsight, what had happened is that I had a birth defect in my heart that I didn't know about. So um, there's a valve called the aortic valve that typically has three leaves that open and close in a triangle. And mine has two leaves, which doesn't sound super uncommon in terms of birth defects in the heart. Um, but I never knew I had it. So somehow um, blood bacteria got into my bloodstream and sort of got stuck in that, that valve and just grew and grew and grew. Um, and so when they found the infection, I was at UK, um, they, they transitioned my care over to a cardiothoracic surgeon. So a CT surgeon named Dr. Retta, who's phenomenal. So Dr. Retta came in the room and said, okay, well, you know, here's what's going on. You have this infection in your heart. It's called endocarditis. Um, and he talked me through the process of replacing my aortic valve and said, okay, you'll have open heart surgery tomorrow. And I just remember thinking, well, they don't tell you you need open heart surgery tomorrow unless you really need open heart surgery tomorrow. So, yeah. okay. Um, and, and so they did do another scan before surgery. And by the time, um, by the time I got to this point, the infection was just really extensive. So it had gotten behind my eyes. The next scan showed that I had a mini stroke. So the bacteria had gotten to my brain as well. I didn't know it. Um, and I have no deficiencies from that, which is great. And so, and then the infection was my heart and my blood. So they did the surgery and replaced everything that needed to be replaced and got the infection out, which for me meant you have four valves in your heart. I had two replaced one because of the infection and one because the valve was fine, but the infection was around it. So all of that. And then um, because of just the damage of the infection, five days later, I got a pacemaker. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited. My pacemaker, they say, hasn't fired in a while, which means that my heart has started beating on its own again, which is yeah. I'm really excited about. Um, so, so yeah, it, it went very quickly from like, I think I have a virus to, oh, this is a big deal. And then just sort of working on the recovery process from there. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just such a crazy story to go. I think this, the speed with which it happened, you know, you shared with me that you ran your fastest half marathon in, I think, November of 2019. And mm -hmm. then all of this happened in the spring of March 2020, which is just that speed is crazy to me. Yeah, yeah. And they, the um, best guess from the doctors is that I actually picked up the infection in November or December of 2019, which would have been like within a month of running that half marathon. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I had no idea I was sick. I mean, I was, I played two soccer games and went on two runs a week before I was admitted to the hospital. So we just, I mean, I had no idea it was going yeah. on. Yeah. It's, and then that part is also crazy to me. It could be so damaging, but also um, have you not know it. Uh, what role, if any, do you think that being active and healthy played in, in your treatment and or recovery? I think it definitely set me up for, for a good trajectory moving forward. Um, I think being so healthy going into everything was almost like... Um, I think being so healthy and so active going into everything like set me up really well when I had to start from scratch on that recovery and, and activity process. Um, I do think, you know, I've talked to doctors a little bit about it and it sounds like pretty much my, my health levels are the thing that maybe masked the illness for, 
for as long as it did, but also probably the thing that set me up to survive the illness. And so it's kind of this like, yeah, there's definitely two pieces to it. Um, so I think it prepared me well for what was coming next, even though I had no idea that's what was coming next. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about the recovery process, you know, to go back to, you know, phase one of getting active again and, and what that looks like. Yeah, that's a great question. So phase one is like in the hospital, uh, physical therapy would come to my room and we would go on. Um, I started with half laps around the hospital floor with a walker. And so this was, you know, that's, that's something that for me was a really good indication of where we were starting from. It's like, okay, two weeks ago I was running and now I'm, I'm doing these walks with a walker. Um, so started there just doing little bits to get moving and, and try to start work on rebuilding muscles. Um, from there, when I got home, I, after a few weeks, I started on, um, a little bit of cardiac rehab stuff at home, which was pretty much like walking around the block and doing some more PT exercises, that sort of thing. And when I say physical therapy exercises, like, um, things like bending your knees, like standing and, and going down and back up, things like that. So definitely, um, things to work on starting from, from phase one. And then, um, through that process got connected with uh, cardiac rehab and went into their phase two program where you actually go to, it's kind of like a gym, um, but they work with you to try to build, work on rebuilding muscle groups and rebuilding fitness. So what was that like mentally and uh, to, to kind of just know that you were running half marathons and then um, to, to pace yourself and to, to kind of go through the process? That was tough. Um, it took, you know, I think in the beginning it was like, okay, I am really sick. Like, I don't know what to expect. I, I think being in the hospital and then going to cardiac rehab was really great because there were milestones like, okay, we want you to walk around the hospital floor three times a day. All right. Well, my surgeon says that I'm going to do that. And so it was very much about doing the next thing that I'm told which I really think goes back to growing up with soccer coaches and you're always doing what your coach says and you really just learn to trust what, what they're asking you to do is right for your fitness level. And so it was that same kind of mentality in the hospital. So, so that was a big shift in mentality. Um, and then from there, just trying to figure out, well, how do I set goals from you know where I am? Before it was like, okay, my goal is to run this race in X months or to, to play in this league for this amount of time. And, and now my goal is like, okay, in a week, I wanna get 300 active minutes in at a moderate level or things like that. So figuring out how to set those goals was um, definitely a shift in mentality. So do you have some upcoming goals that, that you can share with us? Yeah. So my next goal is to be able to, I walk jog right now. My next goal is to be able to jog the whole time for a 5k. And so I'm working toward that. I don't know when it'll happen. Um, but just trying to make progress toward that. Um, in the meantime, it's, it's maintaining the level of activity. So trying to keep um, right now I'm in phase three cardiac rehab, which is excellent. So trying to maintain all of the level of cardio that I have and also all the strength training that I'm working on. Um, so, so yeah, that will be my next, my next goal. Awesome. And it seems like having running to go back to and having some experience with running allows you to be able to set these, these goals that you can see, right. They're pretty concrete, like the, the race length or the amount of time that you might take to do a race or whether you're walking or, or jogging. So kind of falling back on some of the, that running experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, one of the other, like one of the other things shifts in mentality, that's been really interesting for me is starting to focus on, um, the progress that I've made and like the progress I'm making this week, instead of like how close I am to that goal. So it used to be like, okay, my goal is to run this race. And so I'm going to back it up and run, you know, this many miles this week, this many miles next week. And then you can see how much closer you're getting to that. So for me, it's been really interesting and really helpful to start focusing on like how far I've come and, you know, progress that I've made recently, instead of like how far I still am from those goals. Yeah, it's a much more positively framed, like look at what I've done and, and building confidence in, um, in your abilities rather than looking at, you know, the deficits before the next thing that you want to do. That's cool. So what have you learned about yourself through this, this whole experience by being active and healthy and kind of having that taken away and now building it back? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think 
for me, I've learned how, how tough I am. I've always sort of like tried to be, be kind to others and always just sort of thought of myself as having this kind of softer personality. But when it came down to it, like there's a lot of fight in there too. And, and when there's good reason, you know, it's, it, it's a good thing. And so I think figuring out how tough I am and also maybe how high my pain tolerance is. I didn't realize <laughs> that until all of this happened. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not a good way to figure that out, but um, <laughs> it's a good thing to know going forward that you're strong and, and uh, mm -hmm. can handle some, some toughness. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you think about people listening to this podcast or people who maybe read your UK Now story, mm -hmm. what do you hope that they can take away from from your experiences and, and learn about themselves or, um, you know, put into their own life? Yeah. I think the biggest thing is that like, if there's a way to realize that whatever you're doing to be active that day, as long as it's your best, like that's enough and that's what you can do. And I think, um, sometimes, you know, when, when I see other people do things, like I'll read a story about a marathoner and I'm like, oh my gosh, I could never do that. Well, you know, the answer is really like, I'm doing the best I can with my, my activity right now. And so I think realizing that no matter where you are, you can do some and make it work and fit it into the crazy schedule um, is really important. And I would love if, if people were able to come away with that message. So one of the things that we as the Active Women's Health Initiative want to do is, is make sure that um, we support and encourage women in particular to be active. So do you have any advice or tips, things that you think would be helpful to encourage women to be active? Ooh, so for me, um, I think to stay active, there's been a couple of things that have been super helpful. One is to have, um, have some activities that I can do whenever, wherever, no matter if I have equipment around or not. And so that's where running and walking have been super helpful and super important. You know, I, I call it getting the miles in, but like, you know, whether it's 5 a.m. or like evening after dinner, trying to have something as my schedule got crazier that I could always fit in was super helpful. At the same time, recognizing that for team sports, if I'm signed up for a team sport, like a soccer team, I will show up for that game and I will make other things work around that mm -hmm. commitment. And so for me, it's been this balance of commitments where I'm showing up for other people and then things that are there um, that are more flexible in terms of time. And so I would say balancing those two things has been helpful for me, um, especially when you think about women and just how much women have on our plates in general. Yeah. So what else would you like to share with our audience today? You know, I think doing whatever we can do at any moment in time is, is the important thing. And so for me, being able to surround myself with people who encourage that and also try to be a part of encouraging others to do that, whether it be meet up for a walk after work or trying to fit um, active minutes in at, at different times of day has been really important and really cool. So I say, I want to encourage people like, to know that even if you're like me, can't get up off the couch by myself, you can still you can still work up to uh, active minutes and whatever your goals are. Well, you have such a, a positive outlook and an encouraging and inspiring story, and I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you so much for having me, and it's really cool to see all of the work that you all are doing, and I'm looking forward to hearing all of your podcasts. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing with us. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Champions of Active Women podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Active Women's Health Initiative and the Sports Medicine Research Institute within the College of Health Sciences at the University of Kentucky. This episode was produced by the Faculty Media Depot. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share with your social networks, or simply tell a friend about us. If you want to help us sustain the Champions of Active Women podcast, donate to the Active Women's Health Initiative at uky.networkforgood.com. For up-to-date information about our initiative, follow us on social media at UKAWHI. Thank you for joining us as we empower all girls and women to become athletes for life. <laughs>